those entertainment values are untouched. They're still there. What we're doing is we're adding an additional level of appreciation. So now you can enjoy the film for all the reasons you did before. And in addition, because, wow, some of these ideas are blow my mind. You're listening to Good Is In The Details. I'm Gwendolyn Dolsky. And I'm Rudy Salo. And this is the podcast where we learn what we didn't know we didn't know in the spirit of Socrates, all with the aim of a self-improved life, a good life. Today we are talking about film. That's part of the good life. One of Rudy's favorite films. Yeah, I, I would say Blade Runner, which is, by the way, the point of this uh, discussion. Philosophy and Blade Runner, okay? okay. It's a great book with a Timothy Shanahan, Professor Timothy Shanahan of the great school of Loyola Marymount, which is down the street from my house. The book's got a terrific cover. It has Rutger Hauer, who plays Roy, holding the dove right before his demise in the film. If you've ever seen Blade Runner, uh, it's an epic, epic film. This book, this episode made me think about the film in a deeper way than I had ever thought before. I had always wanted to read the book that Blade Runner was based on, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, written by the great Philip K. Dick. Gwen, you may not know this, Philip K. Dick has a Fullerton connection. He's got a connection to, you know, our oh. quasi hometown. His personal library, his where he has his writings and stuff, is actually at the Cal State Fullerton Library. I did not know that. Yeah, we got a we got a connection there. Extremely fun episode where we talk about philosophy and film. What's it like using film to teach philosophy? We talk about AI. We talk about robots. We talk about so many amazing things that even if you've never seen Blade Runner, you will enjoy this episode, I believe. Oh, yeah, because this is really about examining the questions of what does it mean to be human. So if one has not seen Blade Runner, don't worry, I don't want you to run away from this episode. It is really an examination of these qualities of what makes it, what makes us human. And what would a synthetic human be like? Do they have any kind of moral standing? What kind of a relationship would we have with them? What kind of a relationship do they have with death, with their own end? And in trying to create a synthetic human, that means we're trying to come to a deeper understanding of what makes us human. So that's what the conversation is really about. And of course, Tim was so awesome. We're like, you need to come on the show again because he wrote another book on, what was it, Blade Runner 2049? Correct. He wrote a follow-up uh, book on Blade Runner 2049, which was okay. the sequel book a movie that was made with the great Ryan Gosling, as well as Harrison Ford, almost 40 years after the original was released in 1982. I love this episode. You're absolutely right. It's not, it's not just about film. It's really, truly, I mean, the book and the movie and everything is truly explorations of the elements of humanity. I mean, truly, it, it's about consciousness. It's about death. It's about what does it mean to be a human? And it made me think again about the power of film. Film is such an amazing medium, such a great tool in examining life. And I'm so happy that we can somewhat consistently discuss film, bring filmmakers on, bring philosophers on that are dedicated to film, that have the love of film that Timothy clearly does and we use film as a tool to examine life and how to live a better life. Yeah. Okay, let's talk Blade Runner and what does it mean to be human? This is perfect. This is the right question to start with. In my belief, whenever we have an author, an expert on here, and one in particular that has written such a phenomenal book, Tim why did you write this book and why Blade Runner? You know, I had, uh, I had first become aware of the film a couple of years after it came out. I was a graduate student at the time, and there was a flyer on the door of the student union saying there was going to be a screening of a film called Blade Runner. This was probably 1984. The film came out in 82. I had never heard of Blade Runner. I was a full-time student. I was very busy. I'd never heard of the film. I saw the title Blade Runner. I thought, I don't want to watch this. I don't want to watch a film about speed skating. <laughs> so I really was not aware of the film for many, many years. When I started teaching intro philosophy classes, 
I got hooked on using films in the course as a way of getting students into the topics, engaging them, and having a point of reference for discussing various philosophical issues. And I'm still doing that to this day, using films in my intro philosophy classes. And I was thinking about Blade Runner, and I came across an essay by the British philosopher Stephen Mulhall, who had written an essay on Blade Runner in 1994 called Picturing the Human Body and Soul, a Reading of Blade Runner. I read his essay, and I was blown away. I thought, here's this film that I was vaguely aware of, and there are all these issues in it uh, that I was unaware of. And the film seemed much deeper than I was ever previously aware of. So Mulhall's essay, I think, is brilliant. I think it does a great job. And I cite it numerous times in my book. But he deals with a very limited range of issues in Blade Runner. And I thought, my goodness, almost the whole gamut of philosophical issues are there in the film if you attend to the details very, very carefully. So I wrote the book because I wanted to explore the film philosophically. I wasn't writing the book to be a textbook. I wasn't writing it for students. Although when I write, I generally have my students in mind because if I can explain something clearly enough that my students understand it, that's the level I want to aim at. So really I wrote the book so that I would understand the film better. You know, essentially what I do in many of the chapters is I take a philosophical topic, which I have thought about at various times over the years, and I try to figure out how can I come to a conclusion about the philosophical issue by reflecting on aspects of the film Blade Runner. Would you say that if we're since you were talking about intro to philosophy classes and your students, maybe prior to college, your students, maybe they had some kind of an intro to philosophy class, but typically it's usually college where people kind of get deeper into philosophy. Right. Do you suggest to them, hey, if you really want to start getting into philosophy, if you really want to start thinking about it, if you are you trying to connect with them? Is one way to do that, i.e. through film and in particular with Blade Runner? Like, has that, has that ever happened where, you know, students have come to you and say, I'm loving this stuff. How can I get deeper into it? Well, that's one of those, I'll give you a yes and no answer. Students do get interested in philosophy by being exposed to philosophy through film. When I tell people that I introduce students to philosophy through film, some people think, oh, that's got to be the easiest course in the world. They're just watching movies. You're talking about movies. It turns out to be very challenging because most of us have been enculturated, I think, to view movies as entertainment, first and foremost. They're a form of escapism. All the movies that I use in my course are great as entertainment, with maybe one exception. Uh, they're all great as entertainment. So the challenge is getting students to not just appreciate the entertainment value of the film, but also to see there's something more going on here. The film can raise issues in our minds and to some extent address those issues. So I think Blade Runner is up there with, say, The Matrix as being one of those films that touches on lots of different philosophical issues. Now, the second part of your question, I don't use Blade Runner. What? In my courses. That's, but you, I, don't I mean, how do you, it's an easy way to sell books, man. Listen, this is also, we also do finance on this show. Like, if we, if you want to have a side conversation about making money on the side, we could talk. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Why, why? I have a response to the whole film as entertainment thing, but I, please answer that question. Well, okay. Again, it's a, it's a multi part answer. One is I'm keenly aware, I would say painfully aware, that Blade Runner is not everybody's cup of tea. You know, many people don't like the film, I will say for many of the same reasons that the initial audiences, when it first premiered in 80, 1982, didn't like the film. It's very slow. It's a slow paced film. It's very dark in both the literal and the metaphorical sense. It's dark because it seems like it's always night and it's raining and it's gloomy and there are shadows. It's also dark because the themes it raises are kind of heavy. I'd used it once years ago and I did not get a great response from students. The other reason I don't use it, well, there's, I guess there's three reasons now. One is I can't bear to have a discussion about one of my favorite films with students who simply don't like the film. Oh, I guess. It's just okay. too painful. Great answer. I was hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> but then the third thing I'll say really quickly is because I'm dealing with many different philosophical topics, I love the fact that I can use a different film for each of the different topics and really hit the topic hard and zero in on it and target in on it. So Blade Runner is good for covering lots of topics, Okay, but it's still one film. It's only one film. I don't want to use one film for an entire course. I want to use maybe, you know, eight or 10 different films. I get it. So completely understand it. Blade Runner, as in your book, if you look at the chapters that you talk about, humanity, consciousness, death, I mean, Blade Runner touches upon all the big, the big topics. 
just a couple things about film as entertainment. I remember the first time I took a study of film class in college and it had nothing to do with philosophy. It was just, here's film. Like, let's look deeply behind it. I was deeply disturbed by how much the entertainment factor was taken away from me. We were looking at mm. the films in the context of its commentary on war, on its commentary on male-female relationships. And it just, I don't know, it made me, it, it just, for a little while, I actually like, stopped watching films because like it, it removed the entertainment factor. And then I went hardcore into the study of film. But I understand, I understand the difficulty of when students really deeply get involved in film, it can be disconcerting at, at first because we're trained as from little children, you know, Disney on up. This is to entertain. This is so daddy and mommy can can get a break. Just another small thing. The summer of 1982, man, I was five years old. Some of my favorite films of all time, as I'm sitting here in, as I'm sitting here in my office, I'm looking at a poster of Star Trek II, The Wrath of mm-hmm. Behind me um, is a figurine of uh, McReady from The Thing. And, and then, mm-hmm. then you have Blade Runner and E.T. that came out. I mean, I don't remember much of that summer. I actually remember going to the movies in the summer of 1983 when I was six years old. But like, did you see any of those great films in the theater? The only one I saw was E.T. But, do, but like, was there, what was going on in 82? Was was the world a dark place and that people wanted escapism? And that's why E.T. was so popular as opposed to the thing in the noir classic Blade Runner? And let us not forget the epic Conan the Barbarian, also in the summer of 1982. I don't think I can comment on what was going on in the world in 1982. I'm inclined to think that a film like E.T., was massively successful, massively more successful than Blade Runner for many reasons. Partly it was directed by Steven Spielberg. It had an upbeat ending, whereas the original, as you, I'm sure you know, Blade Runner has come out in many different versions. There's been different endings and so forth. The original ending of Blade Runner was very upbeat. Well, relatively upbeat, I should say, relative to the rest of the film, but totally implausible. So E.T. had a kind of feel-good aspect to it that Blade Runner didn't. I'm not sure what to say about the other films. Yeah, the thing is still being debated. Much like is Deckard a replicant, uh, the mm-hmm. thing is still being debated to this very day as to who was the thing at the end of the movie. Like it's mm-hmm. it's, st- it's still one of those it's still one of those kind of questions and and it's so dark. I, we don't need to talk about the thing. I'm just you brought up 1982, you brought up the reception of the film and everything. I, it is it is relevant to the discussion here because the film is it's it's meaningful. There's a lot of topics it covers. You it forces you to think. Some people just maybe not may not be in the mood to think. Sometimes I think I think it's as simple as that. Sometimes you just want entertainment, and that's fair. I have no problem with mm-hmm. that. Well, I can guarantee you, some people are not in the mood to think. Sometimes <laughs> when I'm teaching an eight o'clock class, I was going to say eight a.m. eight a.m. philosophy. <laughs> Brutal. I'm pretty sure Brutal. There are some students in the class who are not in the mood to think. My job and my challenge is to make them want to think. Let me just circle back to something you said earlier, Rudy. I mean, here's something I try to convince my students of. I'm never sure at all how successful I am in convincing them of anything. But I try to convince them that by thinking about certain films philosophically, we're not taking any of the entertainment value away from the film. Those entertainment values are untouched. They're still there. What we're doing is we're adding an additional level of appreciation. So now you can enjoy the film for all the reasons you did before. And in addition, because, wow, some of these ideas are blow my mind. Here's a kind of analogy. I'm sure you're both aware of Richard Dawkins. One of his books is called Unweaving the Rainbow. And the title comes from an essay in the book. And the the basic idea is this. Some people accuse science of undermining our wonder at nature, at our sense of the sublime of nature, that by explaining how the rainbow works in terms of light rays and refraction and reflection and wavelengths, electromagnetic radiation, we're somehow robbing people of the enjoyment of a rainbow. And Dawkins' argument, as you might expect, is no, no, no. The rainbow is just as beautiful and wonderful as ever it was, but now we have an additional level or layer of understanding. Now we understand how the rainbow comes about. So our appreciation is is deepened. So that's the kind of argument I try to make with students in regard to the films. The other thing I'll say is I've been doing this for a long time. When The Matrix came out in the summer of 19, the original Matrix, in the summer of 1999, I was teaching a class that summer and I took my students to the movie theater. We watched it in the theater. Then we went to a coffee shop and we were just, you know, we were, our heads were spinning. Like, what did we just see? In 1999, that was just mind blowing. Okay, fast forward to 2021, 2022, 2023. Almost none of my students have seen The Matrix. They haven't even heard of The Matrix. 
and likewise for, for many of the films I show in the course. So it's not like I'm taking the entertainment that they, the entertainment value they previously had of that film and taking it away from them. They'd never seen The Matrix. So it's all new to them. The other thing is I have them watch the film before we ever talk about it. So that means when they're watching it for the first time, whatever entertainment value there is, they're getting it. And then I start asking them questions about why did this character do that? And why did this happen? And does that make sense? And then we get into the philosophical issues of the films. I think for some films like superhero films, that if there isn't a moral question, the film falls flat. Like, I think that that's actually what makes it so good. So something like um, Black Panther and Wakanda Forever, because that's the freshest in my mind that I just saw, without the moral layers, without these questions of what would you do or weighing the value of, let's just say, one society versus the needs of an entire world, um, or even let's say Peter Parker's question about what can one person do? And if you have talent, then are you obliged to use it to save people? So I would say that the moral layer for a lot of films is actually what makes them good. I do have this question about Blade Runner. So this is what I've been thinking about all weekend as I'm reading your book. One of the great things I think about this question it's asking us, what does it mean to be human? Because if the replicant is built identical to a human where it's indistinguishable, then what is the core characteristic of being human? It can't be, well, you have to be made in a particular way, because even now we know with genetic engineering or with IVF that there's plenty of ways for a baby to come to be. So creation isn't, you know, consciousness, what if feeling pain or suffering? So I think that that is so interesting. I am still hung up on the idea that a robot is a thing. And I have this feeling of, it was a, it was the, the phrase robot slave. And I have been hung up on that all weekend thinking about why that bothers me. And I think the reason is that I think these two terms are not applicable together. They don't belong together because a slave by definition enslaves a person and a robot, by definition, is a thing. So I'm just wondering what your thought is, that it would actually be like a married bachelor, that it's an impossibility to have a robot slave. And that if there was something that was designed as a robot slave, I would question the engineer because I would think, you know, for example, like my blender does something for me. It's designed to do something for me. And if the engineer decided to have it scream out every time I hit the power button, I'd be like, what the hell is wrong with you? What is wrong with the engineer? Why would you design it to feel pain when I actually use it? So if somebody were to design a robot for the purpose of being a slave, that sounds like it's an engineering problem. It doesn't change my view that the robot is still a thing. So I'm I know that that's a lot. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the moral standing of robots. The term robot is used in a number of different ways. Sometimes the term is used to refer to an inorganic, artificially created mechanism that lacks consciousness, lacks any kind of awareness, that's built to perform a certain function for us and so forth. The original word robot comes from the Czech playwright Karol Kapek from his 1921 play, R-U-R, Rossum's Universal Robots. So the word robot comes from a Slavic root, raba, meaning slave or slavery or drudgery. So originally, I mean, etymologically speaking, a robot is a slave. So there's a kind of blurring there about what is a robot? Is it just a machine that does something for us that we made to do something for us? Or is it actually, or could it be a slave? If you built a robot with consciousness and self-awareness, a robot that was a person, and you built it to perform a certain function, and you forced it to perform that function, that kind of robot would be a slave. So Gwen, maybe part of the difficulty of thinking about robots as slaves is if you think that robots are only machines lacking consciousness, it seems hard to see how we could, it's hard for me to think of my toaster as a slave, but maybe that's a result of thinking about robots in too narrow a sense. The, um, the rep, this, is, this gets very interesting, I think. The replicants in Blade Runner are described as robots. At the very beginning of the film, there's the crawl, the text that goes across the screen. And it tells us that in the early 21st century, or in the, or in the, late, 20, uh, in the early, late 20th century, the um, Tyrell Corporation advanced robot evolution into the nexus phase. The replicants are described as robots. 
yet they also seem to be slaves. Tim, isn't it, isn't it um, this is where, and you touch upon this in your book, and by the way, I read, I'm so happy for this interview because I'm a huge Philip K. Dick fan, read a lot of his books, a lot of his short stories, yet I never did do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, which is what Blade Runner is based off of, because I had seen mm-hmm. Blade Runner so many times that I was like, ah, I'll just put that aside. In preparation for this interview, I did finish do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, and in that book, Human beings after the World War Terminus, right, and our world's kind of stuck with all this dust and and it's kind of dark and dreary in my mind. And, you know, that probably explains some of the aesthetics of of the film. You are encouraged to, if you you have the IQ and if you're healthy enough, to go to an off-colony planet. And in order to encourage the humans to go to such off-colony planet... Each human being that goes has a slave, a, a an android for them that will, you know, pretty much work for them, do whatever they want to do, and, and actually provide company, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a little bit of the backstory, if you will, where the book kind of leads into the movie. I mean, that's just one explanation. Yeah, and that's right. And that shows up in the movie. There are scenes where Deckard is outside reading a newspaper, waiting for a seat at the noodle bar, and there are these blimps on wires that are going overhead. And the blimps are advertising the off-world colonies. And they're encouraging people to emigrate where exactly as, Rudy, exactly as you said, if you emigrate, you're given a personal slave. And it's very hard to hear in the film. But if you look at the script and so forth, you can figure this out. They're described very much like slaves on a plantation in the Old South, the tireless field hand who will attend to your every need and so forth. So there the connection between the replicants and slaves is made pretty explicit. Yeah, that's right. So, Gwen, it is one of the tenets of the film that these robots are slaves. And I did not know the, the root word of robot. Thank you for expressing that. It's fascinating. And I didn't know that either. I'm stuck on that. At some point, I'm sh- I know we have to talk about the chatbot AI thing. At some point, the evolution here is going to be there and, and how that works out. But yeah, no, I, I didn't know that the root of the word robot was slave. I really, I got to be honest with you. The only times I've ever connected the two together was through Blade Runner and, and now this book. So that's that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. I think the etymology of words is interesting. Some people, I think, go too far and they think the etymology has magical powers. So that if you know the root of a word, then you know you've gotten really to the essence of the word. So the word robot was invented by Carol Kopeck in this play. But since then, it has a life of its own. So the way that we use the word robot now is broader than just the way that he used it in that play. Gwen? I'm just... Are you, I'm, I'm just, answered, I'm, or you, just, I'm, you still floored? I'm still... still floored? Yeah, well, I didn't... I mean, I didn't know that. I just... I guess what I was hung up on is that, yeah, just this idea of if you wanted to create a thing to do all this work for you then why would you include consciousness in that? Because that seems to be problem. That that seems to be some, I think that's something wrong with the creator. That's to me, that's where the moral problem is. Is like, why, why would you do that? But. Well, I mean, that's the debate, right? Wait, hold on. I'm, I'm, I got I got to stop you right there. You're pointing out the debate. You're, you're, what you just said subsumed that these, ro- that these, excuse me, these replicants for all I know, they don't want to be called robots. You know, these days you got to be careful. <laughs> uh, these, the, these, the, this class, whether or not they have consciousness is the question. In the book, my interpretation is they, that they don't. In the book, it comes down to whether or not they have empathy. And the whole test, the test that Deckard uses both in the book as well as in the movie, it's an empathy test. And I guess I suppose you could take you could take the view that perhaps Philip K. Dick thinks that Empathy is the root of consciousness. And and here, when Deckard applies the test in Blade Runner, the film, the way that he recognizes w- uh, whether something is a robot or a human it is this test that measures empathy. And, and so you'd, ha- you'd have to take the position that these robots are don't have consciousness if you believe that empathy is the root of consciousness. I don't know. I, I'm not the ex- expert here, Tim. You, you are. Am I okay with that explanation? I, I, I'm not even sure I feel comfortable describing myself as the expert here. But um, right. So in, in both the book and in the film, the Deckard character uses the Voigtkampf machine to test replicants for empathy. Empathy is supposed to be the characteristic in both the book and the film that distinguishes androids, as they're called in the book, or replicants, as they're called in the film, from humans. So at the beginning of Blade Runner, another Blade Runner is applying the Voigtkampf test to Leon, one of the replicants. And the questions are supposed to elicit emotional responses from him. Leon, you've, you're, you're in the desert and there's a tortoise 
on its back baking in the sun and you're not doing anything about it. Why is that, Leon? Right? And then, of course, Leon blasts him into the next room uh, shortly thereafter. So empathy is supposed to be the thing in both the film and the book that distinguishes humans from non-humans. Of course, in the film, that gets problematized because in certain cases, the replicants seem to exhibit empathy, at least toward one another. And Deckard, who is, let's suppose Deckard is human, Deckard and his boss, Bryant and Gaff, the Edward James Olmos character, they seem to exhibit very little, if any, empathy for most of the film. So the film seems to want the audience to say, to, wants the audience to question whether empathy really is the distinguishing characteristic between humans and non-humans. And if it is, then it looks like the differences between humans and replicants isn't all that great after all. And therefore, to go back to the slavery issue, maybe they can't be, shouldn't be enslaved. And now a quick break to tell you about Newsly. Newsly is that all-in-one audio super app for iOS and Android. It picks up on the top trending articles on the web, on topics you choose at any given moment, and reads them to you in a natural human voice. The entire web becomes listenable for the first time, all in one place. You can browse articles from topics you choose and start playing. Stop scrolling and start listening. You can follow any topics as specific as you like, from sports to tech to business to philosophy or transportation. It will find you the latest articles and read them to you aloud. And they have podcasts as well. Hey, you can listen to Good is in the Details. Download and use Newsly for free now from newsly.me. And I will put a link in the description and use promo code the details and you get one month free premium subscription. That's newsly.me offer code the details. And now back to the show. That's what I really like about this question is that it's making us pinpoint, wait a minute, what does make you human? And even the question of memories, um, if you... <laughs> you know, if they're doing all of this work to try to reconstruct what it means to be human, then as we're watching it, and as I'm reading your book, I'm like, wait a minute, what, what is it that makes us human? Or, you know, even the empathy thing, you can find somebody like, let's say a serial killer who has absolutely no empathy, but we wouldn't say that they weren't human. So even empathy isn't required for somebody to be human. Um, mm -hmm. memories can be, somebody can be in an accident and lose all of their memories and they are a different person, but we would never deny that they were human because they didn't have memories. I'm also just wondering about this notion of love. I think because there've been a couple, let's talk about love for a second. <laughs> there's been these other films like her, this idea of somebody, you know, falling in love with a Siri type thing. I was also thinking about at the end of your book, we were talking about some of the existential thinkers when it came to the meaning of life and time. And there's a novel by Simone de Beauvoir called All Men Are Mortal. And she toys around with this idea of somebody having, um, be, becoming immortal and living forever. And this idea of he is no longer human. And there's this one scene that stands out to me where the name's uh, Fosca. He is courting a woman and she looks at him, she knows that he's living forever and she cannot love him back. And he doesn't understand why. She explains, do you hear that woman singing outside, outside the window? And he says, yes. And she says, isn't it all the more lovely because one day she will die. And that's when she, this woman was trying to explain she cannot be in love with somebody who will live forever because it can never, they can never have any kind of symmetry, any kind of reciprocity. It was just impossible. And I was thinking about that with the notion of Blade Runner of is the stance of the film or what is your position? Is love possible if hypothetically a replicant could even be what it is in the film? Or would there always be a lack of symmetry? Does love require like a romantic love? Because is the question... Can there be love between two individuals when one of them is mortal and one of them is immortal? And that's why I'm is wondering if there's a parallel question. between that and the replicant human. Since the replicant well, okay. is not human, is human-like, is yeah. love actually, could somebody really, it, could that be an authentic romantic love? Is that even possible? Clearly, you've never seen the 80s classic Highlander because uh, that's a there's a there's a whole other element of that film, but we're, we're not going to talk about that one. Right now. <laughs> Sorry, Tim, I'm a I'm a big film nerd. If you haven't figured that out, yeah. So I'm trying to figure out what would prevent anyone from saying that there could be genuine love between two beings with an asymmetrical lifespan. I mean, already we know that women live longer than men. 
on average. So there's an asymmetry. That doesn't seem to prevent there being genuine love yep. between men and women. There's love of a different kind between parents and children. And there's an asymmetry. There's also uh, the love between my wife and I plan on living forever because I, I, much like Roy, uh, have big problems with death and I want to talk about that chapter. But so okay. when you know that fact, yes, you can love somebody who plans on living forever. Well, I think the thing was if somebody was um, – now I'm thinking about the, the time span because it would be like in Beauvoir's idea is that if somebody is going to be immortal and the other person is just going to live a regular human cycle, that person who's living the regular human cycle is giving so much more to the relationship than the other person could possibly give back because they are no longer human. And so I'm just wondering if there isn't some sort of a deficit, if we're falling in love with something that is a replicant, a robot that's not human, if that's a, if we're depriving ourselves of the essence of love, which requires a vulnerability and embarrassment and fear and shame in front of another, that that is partly what is required in love. But if something is designed to just be your being, then that lack of effort and there's not as much consequence to losing as opposed to losing another person, that that would make love between a replicant, a robot, and a human problematic. Well, just really quick. So the replicants that are assigned to the human, they're, I mean, sure, maybe the human would fall in love with their slave in the off-world colonies, but both in the, uh, you know, there. So if that, the love that is in Blade Runner, okay, is between Deckard, okay, and Rachel, right? She's the robot that doesn't know she's a robot. She's supposed to be some kind of conglomeration of, of Tyrell's niece. And depending upon which version of Blade Runner that you that, that you watched, if you watch the one with the happy ending, you learn at the very end that she is does not have the built-in failsafe of four or six years of death built in. So it's interesting, your question, because if you watch Blade Runner 2049, you learn that Deckard and Rachel... Spoiler alert here, they fall in love, they actually have a kid, they have a half-human, half-android child, that this whole mythic thing, that's, that's, that's Blade Runner 2049. But that's the continuation of the happy ending story of the original Blade Runner. Not quite original, that, I think Ridley Scott was forced to put in that happy ending because there were some test audiences that didn't like the super noir, ambiguous ending. But it's interesting because, you know, can you fall in love if you know something's going to die? Although both Deckard and and Rachel are mortal. So, I mean, if you first of all, you have to take the position that Deckard is not himself a replicant, which I know you touched upon in your book, Tim, very excellently. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I you know, I don't know, your, 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 your question's, a, it's, a, it's a hard one to, I don't know, are you still talking about the slave stuff? I'm, I'm not really quite sure. You know, there, there's so many complicated issues that are interweaving here. I, my inclination is to take a very simple approach to this and just say, the heart has its reasons. Anybody can fall in love with anybody and anybody can stay in love with anybody under all different kinds of circumstances. They're both mortal. They're both immortal. One is mortal. One is immortal. One is human. One is, let's say, a synthetic human, because that's what Rachel and the replicants are. I mean, I almost want to put the word robot away for time being and say, what are they? They're synthetic humans. They're not even artificial, really, because they're real. They're very real. But the only difference is how they're made. Humans are born. Replicants are made. Humans come about through natural processes. Replicants come, come about indirectly through natural processes by being made in labs like Chew's, iWorks, and so forth. So that's if that's right, I don't see any reason why any kind of being can't be in love with and stay in love with any other kind of being, despite massive differences between them. Yeah. Hey, Gwen, I suggest you go back and listen to our ethics of sex bot re um, episode. I think maybe you feel <laughs> a lot better because uh, we've definitely talked about with uh, definitely talked about this topic on there. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, yeah, yeah. I'm sure no, you have another question. No, but I mean, I, I think that I think when your, your question is fascinating, I mean, I've written a bunch of stuff on Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049 since this book came out. And at least a couple of the essays deal with love. So, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this book. Oh, all right. That's going to be oh, our I'm next. Getting, getting my hands on that one. Well, Blade Runner 2049. Tim, so I think you're going to have to come back on the show. Blade Runner 2049, <laughs> a philosophical exploration. Oh, I can't wait to read that. So, um, and we can talk about this some other time if you want. But one of the essays I have in this book is called Her Eyes Were Green, Intimate Relationships in Blade Runner 2049. There's a lot that we talked about with regard to love and romantic relationships in both films. In Blade Runner 2049, the central love relationship is between 
a replicant, and a hologram. That raises all kinds of other interesting questions about romantic relationships. What I was thinking also, sorry, this popped into my head, but part of also with the love is, let's say, a committed romantic relationship is that the person that you're with, they are going to even physically be different. You know, this idea of sickness and health or like, you know, even with a pregnancy, I mean, me, I gained a third of my body weight <laughs> and then I took it back off and, you know, there's the healing process, there's the aging, things move. With the replicant, you don't have that built in. Like that's part of the loving is it is the, the person, even though the physical stuff or the initial attraction will be gone. But it seems like in the films that some of that hinges on the, the physical attraction, that kind of lust before you get to any of the love. And it seems to me that one of the characteristics of love is that it is that decision process. It's not that falling into, it's that decision to um, care and be cared for by somebody else. Mm -hmm. And is that possible with the, like, if you fall in love with a replicant, do, do they have the built-in aging process? That's what I'm wondering. So the answer is no, they don't. At least the ones that were the Nexus sixes that uh, put Rachel Rosen, put Rachel aside. Like, okay. You can't, she's something that's different. Without her, you wouldn't have Blade Runner 2049 um, in the continuation of the stories. The replicants themselves had a fail-safe date. It was either four or six years, Tim, you can correct me. They died. In fact, at the end, you witness a death. You see Roy die his last words are now it is time to die he dies it releases the dove which beautiful scene and i mean he he stays i mean he's born and dies the same exact way that that he looks i would say almost almost if you look at the scenes of roy when he's pursuing deckard especially on the rooftop and he's leaning out the window and he's feeling the rain on his face and he's taunting deckard you can see on his skin, his skin is changing. There are these blo these purple blotches appearing on his shoulders, on his back, on his chest. Yep. It's one of the little details that Ridley Scott put into the film to make it worth looking at very carefully because there's so many little details that it's easy to miss on a first viewing. So he is, in a way, what Roy is experiencing at the very end is what J.F. Sebastian describes as accelerated decrepitude. It's a speeding up of the process of moving toward toward death one of the reasons why i think this is a very timely episode and this is me is my interpretation uh, blade runner your book your next book and all these questions that we're talking about is really what we are we are we are on the cusp of, i believe maybe not on the cusp maybe we've already been into it we're so close to chatbot is here every day the meta world uh, autonomous vehicles like technology is on this strange place where what's real what is real who is real like you can go online and i mean i'm getting text messages and what's up additions friends definitely from robots are definitely things that are, that are that are made up i can look at the pictures of people and i'm like oh that's just some bot that's there to like try to get my information and there's a fantastic quote from philip k dick where you're talking about well what what is a real human what does it actually mean is a quote that you put in your book that i think is really relevant for today or fake humans will generate fake realities and then sell them to other humans turning them eventually into forgeries of themselves so we end up with fake humans inventing fake realities and peddling them to other fake humans now that's talking about the fake realities being sold to maybe some other folks. But right now, we are all getting text messages from bots, bots that were created in order to try to get us to put our inf personal information in and, and they, st they steal our identities, right? Like identity theft is a, is a big deal. So these issues that are addressed both by Philip K. Dick and in your book and in, in Androids and everything, this is it. This is what we're going to be talking about for like the next 10 or 50 years. And I'm just curious, mm -hmm. as you were seeing all the chatbot stuff, you could put your picture in online and they'll, and they'll make some artificial intelligence rendition of yourself. Are you afraid of that stuff because of your expertise in Blade Runner? Uh, no. And it's not because I'm not afraid. <laughs> it's because I tend to think that the issues that Blade Runner is raising are different in some ways than the issues that you're mentioning. What do I mean by that? Blade Runner raises all kinds of questions about what's real and what isn't real. So that's a similarity. That's definitely an overlap and a commonality between Blade Runner and the kinds of concerns you're expressing. But as I understand the, the, the concerns you're expressing, those have to do with artificial intelligence and the rise of AI and so forth. Now, the replicants in Blade Runner, they're a kind of AI. Well, why? They're artificially made and they're intelligent. But as Gwen pointed out already, that kind of AI, the organic AI, is something we can already do. 
I mean, if you have in vitro fertilization, that's an artificial, to some extent, form of reproduction, and it produces what? Eventually, hopefully, an intelligent human being. That seems to me very different from the kind of AI that's based in digital electronic computers. And that's where the concern comes from, I think. But that's where it's increasingly coming from, as we see things like chat, GPT, and other things develop. Got it. So there's organic AI, which is one segment of Blade Runner. And then there's this other AI, which we're, we're really on the cusp of, of true AI. You know, when I say organic AI, I'm just trying to be literal. So, you know, nobody really talks about organic AI, I don't think. When people talk about AI, I would say virtually always they're thinking about the digital electronic version. Strictly speaking, the replicants are artificial, artificially made, and they're intelligent. But that's that's not almost never what people are talking about when they talk about AI, in my experience. So are you afraid of chatbot? <laughs> by, by the way, by the way, there's a line in Blade Runner, which is relevant to this, where it's in J.F. Sebastian's apartment. I know what you're going to say. He realizes that Roy Batty and Pris are Nexus 6 replicants. And he says, you're Nexus 6, aren't you? Show me something. And Roy says, we're not computers, Sebastian. You're absolutely right. And it's a very, I, in the book I discussed this, it's a very puzzling thing to say because Sebastian didn't say anything about you being computers. Why did he jump to we're not computers? And I try to give an explanation or interpretation of that in the book that Roy is emphasizing their physicality, their organic nature. That explains why Pris then does a gymnastic move and plunges her hat, hand into a beaker of boiling water. She's showing that she's physical and not just physical, but just physicality because computers are physical things too, after all, but she's organic and living unlike a digital computer would be. So here, here's the controversial question again, Tim. Yeah. Are you afraid of this chatbot thing taking over? Uh, well, I'm not. I'm not. Um, Is it because we're so much smarter that we'll outsmart it? <laughs> it's partly because it takes more than the bare possibility to generate fear in me. I, I mean, a lot of things don't scare me. I mean, not because I'm fearless and courageous, just because I think it just doesn't, things don't affect me that way very much. So that's kind of a psychological response, I guess. Secondly, I'm going to go way out on a limb here. Go for it. I go out on a limb all the time on this show. Don't even get me started on aliens. <laughs> I think there are lots of incentives in the media to portray AI as an ominous threat to humanity because it attracts eyeballs and keeps them there and so forth. But I think many people that work in AI have a much more sober view of the limitations of AI and are therefore a lot less worried about it. Do you think it's because, and this tie back into Blade Runner, tie back into our discussion, do you think it's because the people that work in AI know that there's no way this thing will ever achieve consciousness? I, I don't think that's the reason. Okay. Okay. I don't think that's the reason. I think people that are really into AI and developing it have no reason to think that it couldn't develop consciousness. If consciousness ultimately is just computation, then it's only a matter of getting powerful enough computers to be conscious. Whether consciousness is just computation is, of course, a huge and controversial question yep. in its own right. Well, Rudy, I guess I would answer your question, other question this way. I'm not worried about AI taking over the world and enslaving humans. I'm worried about what humans will do with AI to control and enslave each other. So it ultimately comes down to a fear of humans and what humans are going to do with the AI rather than a fear of an autonomous AI, which is set against all humanity. I'm more concerned with what humans are going to do with it for their own yeah. ends. Which, which goes right back to Gwen's point about the problems of the makers, the problems of the engineers, the building of the slaves, the all, all of that. I mean, that's that's really the... That really ties this whole thing together, ties your your fear together. It's like AI is what it is, but look at us as humans. Look at look at look at the capabilities, both the bad and the good, that we have that can really turn this into the nightmare scenario. I've been thinking about this question about like the the AI and like the chat stuff and writing things, and I don't have a fear of it because there are some things that technology can't do for me. So in the same way, vehicles don't mean that I don't ever want to walk. Like something can't actually do something for me, like long distance movement or exercise. I still have to do that. And that's partly what makes me homo sapien. And same thing with contemplation. So programs that can write, that's great. But I realized like, you know, like I told you Friday, um, I was going out and I was going to work on, you know, the book that you and I are putting together, take a look at the draft. And that is a real joy for me to sit out at a cafe 
And well, this was Mexican and I had a margarita, but we to sit down with a draft of my work and look at the construction of the sentences and think out what is it that I want to say. That is a personal joy, just the joy of contemplation and also the joy of walking, for instance, that technology is there, but those are the things that it can't ever replace for me because that's just what it means for me to exist as a human, for me to enjoy myself. Can I just respond to that? Mm-hmm. So it sounds like the idea would be, I'm not going to fear the advance of AI or things like that technology because there, there'll still be things I can do that it can't do for me. That might be right, but that would still leave a huge swath of things it can do that ought to be of concern to us. Even if there's an enclave of things that can't do for us, that's consistent with it doing lots and lots and lots of other things, which we don't want it to be doing that Mm -hmm. impact on us and our well-being. So what do I mean by that? You know, I think about my students a lot. The fact that all of my students have smartphones doesn't prevent me from going for a walk. But the fact that all of them have smartphones may have an impact on their attention spans, which does impact my ability to get them to engage with something meaningful for extended periods of time. So even though the technology will not prevent me from doing certain things that I value, it can still have effects upon me that I'd rather it not have on me. That's a very simple example, but... No, I I completely agree. I think that that is a real issue is that, you know, just being older, it's easy for me to even, you know, enjoy social media and get sucked into it. But I have the wherewithal that I remember a time before it and I'm able to turn it off. Whereas younger generations are having a harder time, Gen Z is having a hard time turning it off. And I do think that that's a real detriment because just we're contemplative beings and we're removing something from what it means to be human that helps us evolve. And so the attention that's going towards social media and the scrolling and seeing what other people are doing or what other people think of you is actually detrimental to one's um, mental health. All of the studies are showing in that way. We're not supposed to always be focusing on everybody else. So I can I can see that. And then the impact on, on you <laughs> walking around on campus, walking around on campus and everyone's on their phone and you just want people to move or looking at the phone while walking in a parking lot. That to me is absolutely insane. That's like the, mm-hmm. you should not be looking at your phone while walking through a parking lot. Like that's just a, that's a no. You know, Gwen, I think what you just said uh, in a way connects up with a question you posed almost toward the beginning of this discussion, the question about what does it mean to be human? So there's probably two ways of approaching the question, what does it mean to be human? One would be to come up with a definition of the human, a set of necessary and sufficient conditions that would include all humans and exclude all non-humans. The other thing that might be meant by asking what does it mean to be human is what do we value about human beings? What do we think makes human beings valuable? And what do we think makes a human life a good human life? That second way, the first way of looking at the question is trying to get at a definition, something objective. The second way of looking at the question is asking us about our values, essentially. So um, when you lament people walking around in parking lots staring at their, their phones, I interpret that as a kind of sadness that there's, a hu- there's an element of being human that's missing in those instances. It's not that the people aren't human. I'm not saying that. It's that they're missing out on certain human experiences that they otherwise might have. They could be starting a conversation with you in the parking lot rather than looking at their phone. Sherry Turkle wrote a book called Alone Together, and it tackles it tackles that. She was talking about being in Paris with her 16-year-old daughter, and her daughter was taking pictures of everything and then putting it on social media. And Sherry Turkle was talking about when she was younger and she would travel, part of the point of traveling was that you didn't have contact with everybody at home and you could actually just be lost in the space instead of mm-hmm. sharing. Well, I, can I ask I have, one more I, question? I, I know we have to get going, but sure. no, I, I sure, just haven't. Uh, okay. I'm still hung up on this. And I think I'm kind of influenced by the philosopher John Searle in this moment. So I don't want to be too esoteric so that everybody can listen, but I'm just wondering about the, the question of knowledge that let's say, To me, that's maybe one of my hangups. And when we say, well, like the replicant knows or artificial intelligence knows, and there's a part of me that's thinking, but does it know? So if you ask me what two plus two is and I say four, I have knowledge of that. I'm able to work it out. I put two plus two into my calculator and it spits out four, but I wouldn't say that the calculator understands four, understands addition. Is there any, what about 
when, what about the question of knowledge? Or is that too big? We only have a few minutes left. But do they really know? Or is that one of the distinguishing factors between the replicant and the human being? How are they different from the calculator spitting out an answer? So I think there's a couple of ways of approaching this. One is, if we're thinking about the film Blade Runner, the replicants are just, in my view, synthetic human beings. Okay. I mean, they're, they're, they're virtually indistinguishable from normal human beings. They're stronger in some cases. They're faster and so forth. So if that's right, then however it is that we understand things, the replicants understand things in the very same way, using the very same processes. So they're just synthetic humans. They're just made in a different way. A different question is whether you can build a machine, a computer, that's eventually capable of understanding. Now, Searle thinks you can. Surprisingly, Searle thinks you can. Why do I say this? He says so explicitly because he thinks we're machines and we understand. So Searle's claim is that you can certainly build machines that understand because we're machines and we understand. His claim is that you can't build something which merely computes Mm. that understands. Because computation is just manipulating symbols according to formal rules. And his argument is that understanding requires more than manipulating manipulating symbols according to formal rules. It's not computation. Are we computers on his view? Damn straight. We are, we are totally computers because okay. we compute. Two plus two equals four. I just did it. I'm a computer. But he wants to say we're not mere computers and that a mere computer can never understand things. Now, this is, as you know, this is very controversial, this argument. What's the difference? He says computers have syntax, but not semantics. They can't attribute meaning to things. Now, this gets tricky because we attribute meaning to things, of course, but we don't really know how we do it. We know that we do it. We're not quite sure how we do it. Wow. Yeah. I'm so if we're not sure, if that. we're not sure how we do it, if we're, here's the, here's the punchline. If we attribute meaning to things and we're not sure how we do it, we shouldn't be too confident that mere computers can't do it since we don't really know how we do it. Whoa. I mean, this goes, this goes back to the, 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 the mind, the mind, mind body issue. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've got bodies, we've got minds. We've got no clue really about how brains generate minds. And my students, my stu- when I tell my students this, they look at me like I'm just uninformed or ignorant. Or I haven't read the, neuro- the latest neurophysiology textbooks, but there's nothing in those books that explains this. Look how Anyways. happy Rudy is. This is, this is Rudy's, can't, Rudy's can't, stunned can't face is also his happy face. Can't, yeah, I can't, I can't end on, on, on me just saying, whoa, I have to, I have to, <laughs> I have to, I have to bury myself before here. Let me, let me sound stupid instead of just actually really. In your book, you point out that arguments that one ought not to consider death bad or to fear it go back to at least Socrates. Uh, when he yeah. was facing execution, uh, Socrates says that to fear death is to think oneself wise when one is not, and to think that one knows when one does not. So, Tim, if you've listened to any of our episodes, you will realize that I have a fundamental problem with the concept of death. And much like Roy, plan on cheating it. And much like Roy, the reason why I too fear death, it has not, yes, I'm worried about my family and friends and how their, how their lives are going to fall apart without me in it because I'm the most important being on earth. Ha ha ha. Just kidding. No, that's actually not the reason why. It is much like what you point out in the book where it says the genius of the movie is that it makes us feel the pain of Roy. Feels when faced with the knowledge of his approaching death in conjunction with his consciousness of potentiality for knowledge and accomplishment. The reason why I face death is there are so many awesome things in life. And I feel like I'm, people will say that I do too much, you know, that I I have too many activities, that I have too many interests, that I have too many hobbies. The reason why is because I love life so much. There's so many things that we were it's so privileged to do in the world because we're, we're lucky to be alive and have health and to do these things. I feel like I am like Roy in that he wants more life to, uh, I think, to one of the arguments is that he wants to achieve more things or see more things. But, you know, I know you take issue with that in, in your book. And, and so what I'm asking you is to help me. Help me accept death, okay? If you can, if, uh, you know, I know I, I'm not trying to put some religious things onto you, but tell me something that'll make me feel better. So I begin by making a distinction. Philosophers love distinctions. You might have a reason to want to postpone death as long as possible without necessarily fearing death. So you might think that life is a good thing, and the more you have of it, so long as it's good, the better off you are. 
and that would give you a reason to want to prolong your life and to live as long as possible. That need not entail fear of death. I mean, a fear of death, I think, is something different. A fear of death is a strong emotion that something bad, there's something bad about death. <laughs> the, the look on your face, like, I'm not buying this for a moment. It's um, good. It's good. I'm, I'm, you know what I'm doing? I'm computing, okay? They're much, much like, much like <laughs> what we're talking about here. Yeah. Sometimes okay. when you type something in, it says error. It's not error. Okay. It, what's going on in my mind is this the spinning motion of like, you know, when something's trying to figure out. So uh, that, it's working. It's working. It's pretty pretty good so okay, far. So, no errors so, so let, far. Let, let, me, let me try to connect this back to a, a discussion in the book. So in that same chapter that you're referring to, after it discusses Socrates, it discusses Epicurus. And Epicurus had an argument, very famous argument for why we ought not to fear death. The argument is super simple. He says, while we are alive, death is not. When we are dead, we are not. So he's thinking of death as personal annihilation. After death, you simply no longer are. There's no reason in his view to fear a state of non-existence. You can't suffer. If you don't exist, you can't experience anything. If you don't exist, you won't know that you're dead if you don't exist. So that's his argument for why we ought not to fear death. Now, the criticism of this from the very beginning has been, okay, fine, maybe we ought not to fear death, but we still should be sad or lament the fact that we do die for the very reason that you mentioned, Rudy. It's basically FOMO, right? It's missing out. If I don't continue to exist, there are so many things I won't be able to accomplish so many things I won't know and so forth. Now, if death is annihilation, of course, you won't know. Oh, I'll know. I'll know. I'll know. I'll know. I, I, so, I make the argument here. There's so much good. We didn't even touch upon this. Timmy should have, we have to have you on again. There's so much good film noir in the world. You can't even, you can't even watch all of it. I'm going to be really pissed when I'm dead because I didn't, I wasn't able to watch all of it. You have no idea how angry I'm going to be. Rudy, I, I, I'm an angry man. At the maybe base. there's film you noir. Have no idea, all yeah, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe God will put a, a a screening room like on one of the clouds that you'll From be your mouth seeing. to God's ears. He, I hope he has something. Sorry, Tim, I'm a little crazy. If you haven't figured I'm, that out, Rudy, I'm basically with you. I mean, I want to keep going. I want to keep going as long as I can because I keep finding new and interesting things to engage me and so forth. But I can imagine there could come a time when I view things differently. Yeah, for sure. So I would put it this way. I wouldn't mind having conditional immortality in the sense that I can live as long as I want to. I don't think I would accept an offer of unconditional immortality, which says you're going to live forever whether you like it or not, because things could go that way or things could go that way. And if yep. things go that way, I don't want to be burdened yep. with immortality. So if I could have immortality on my terms, I would be all for it for the reason that you mentioned. It wouldn't be because of a fear of death at all. I love it. It would be for the opportunity to experience more things. I love it. Yeah, this was a great experience. Thank you for writing this book. Thank you for coming on to the show. I want to read your next book. Maybe you'd be willing to come on. Can we and do it again? Another crazy, crazy person again. I, sure. I love this stuff, man. <laughs> and so, look, whether your students know it or not, or whether they appreciate it or not, know that you you have two people here that love this stuff. Well, it's been a pleasure discussing it with you. Um, I don't, I, I don't get to discuss Blade Runner and these issues uh, every day, so this is, you know, a treat for me. Anytime, Tim. Thank you, thank you, Tim. You're very welcome. Good is in the details is produced by Dr. Gwendolyn Dolsky and Rudy Sallow. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts and you're enjoying the show, please scroll down to the bottom and hit that five star review. And if you'd like extra content and support the show, check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash good is in the details. Also look for us on Instagram, good is in the details pod. Take a screenshot of your favorite episode and tag us. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Dr. Shanahan, for sharing your voice, for letting us learn about Blade Runner and all of the philosophical issues that come with it. And we look forward to having you again. Okay, until next time. Bye.